thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, uh, to talk about something which has been my passion for the last uh, 15 years, and we really hope that we can move this area forward in the next 10 years with some of the significant uh, innovations which are now really making things possible. Uh, my, I have a few disclosures, uh, uh, nothing which affects the talk today. I do hold a number of patents, particularly with respect to some of the lessons we've learned in the field of telesurgery, no financial. Most importantly, as you can see, I'm a civilian, and even worse, I'm a Canadian. However, uh, many of the work that I've done was done in conjunction with the U.S. military, both TATRIC and DARPA, and the Canadian government, which is currently funding uh, many of the work that we are doing because, uh, believe it or not, many parts of Canada actually resembles uh, a very extreme environments that we find ourselves with remote and, and, and difficult to get to for uh, to providing medical care. Uh, it is not a secret that the primary impetus behind development of the current surgical robots available, right now we only have uh, primarily Da Vinci, but in the past we had Zeus and there are other systems being developed, was the investment that the U.S. military made in, in the early 1990s, thank you, thanks to our panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Sataba, who was at the time the program director at DARPA, which had the vision that uh, robots can be used to bring the surgeon closer to the injured soldier in the battlefield, uh, because even though um, the soldiers are transferred as fast as possible, and we heard today how resuscitation is so essential in maintaining life and, and function. Um, if we can get that process started earlier, um, we, through the use of uh, robotics and in telesurgery, we may actually be able to preserve more, more function and lives. And this led to the original uh, investment by the U.S. military uh, through Stanford Research Institute and development of the M7 robot. Here you see the M7 robot, which some of you may recognize, quite similar to the current Da Vinci. In fact, this is the precursor of the Da Vinci. Uh, you see a young John Barsox there behind the council there. Some of you may recognize him. He served on a number of uh, calls of duty, I think. He was in charge of the medical uh, operations in Iraq for a period of time. I think he's back. Um, and the system was a completely open surgical system, it was not a laparoscopic uh, system, it was developed for provision of uh, surgical care in the battlefield. The problem with it was it was large and um, it, it, it went through a, minimum, a field evaluation and r later on uh, some of those patents went on uh, to basically create a company intuitive and, uh, and that, I think the rest is history. Um, the, the idea behind those uh, robots, uh, robotic development and the telesurgery, however, did not die. A friend of mine, Jacques Moresco, um, we, we had been talking about uh, the whole option of telesurgery. In September 7, 2001, uh, performed the first experiment in, in, in telesurgery in, in a live patient. Now, he, he only performed a very small portion of an operation, a simple operation, a laparoscopic called cystectomy. There were a number of surgeons by the patient's bedside. Uh, but the, it was, he was able to demonstrate that it is possible to control a robot from a distance to perform part of a surgical task. And that was a very important demonstration of how this technology can potentially reach a patient, reach a patient from a distance. Uh, we uh, had been working on this, again, to reach some of the northern uh, communities in Canada, which uh, really have, are often devoid of not only physicians and surgeons, and require made evac uh, uh, evacuations of patients, sometimes several hours away. And the idea was, can a surgeon from some of the teaching hospitals provide surgical care in, in patients in, in more remote regions of, of, of Canada? And we started a program in 2003, performing complex operations um, on patients from fundal placation, from bowel resections, uh, splenectomies, um, in patients in remote part of Canada. We did 24 surgeries, uh, quite complex surgery, and we were able to demonstrate that uh, it is possible to, in fact, uh, perform uh, surgeries. Now, we did require somebody to set up the robot at the site, and uh, usually there was uh, a, a ample redundancy in the communication uh, connection in order to ensure that if, if one line goes down, there is a way of uh, being able to complete the task. 
but it was certainly a very rich experience in, in not only being able to offer surgery to patients at a distance, but also at the same time, if there was a local surgeon, training in them in the process. Um, we learned a lot of lessons. Um, we, we were able to show that latency or time delay, which is cause, uh, which is an important factor in, in telesurgery, um, it, the human brain is able to adapt to it to a point. Uh, about up to 300 milliseconds was the limit by which safely we, the human brain can adapt to time delay and yet uh, be able to perform. All it did was to slow the process down. So there is me suturing the cura in a patient which is 400 miles away from me. So I'm actually operating on a patient 400 miles away. And as you can see, I'm able to use a, a, a tool silk suture to, to close the cura in this patient. Now, those who have witnessed robotic surgery, you see that it's a little bit slower than it would be. And that's actually, I'm not doing this consciously. My brain is adapting to the fact that when I do an action, it takes 150, 175 milliseconds in this case before I can actually see what I've done. And in order to allow for that so that it, it's not a sort of uh, uh, broken into little steps, is that you just slow yourself down. Uh, above 300 milliseconds, it becomes very difficult for, for most surgeons to operate. Uh, there are some exceptional uh, uh, surgeons who can continue to operate at higher, up to 500 milliseconds, and we were able to show that. However, when you look at satellite latencies, which is about 750 milliseconds, that becomes almost impossible to do telesurgery. And that's why the US military has invested in, in low latency communication uh, coverage in fields of battle, because it allows you to actually reach without that type of latency that satellite uh, provides. Um, and that uh, sort of explains some of the background behind it. Uh, this was followed by a number of missions that we did with uh, uh, TATRIC, DARPA, NASA, and the Canadian Space Agency called NEMO missions. It was in a, in a remote uh, um, underwater station in, off Key Largo, uh, where we, 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 we stuck four astronauts who were about to go up to space, and we, we, we did a series of experiments. And these missions were primarily medical missions, uh, trying to understand what we can do in such remote areas with high latency. Uh, initially, NASA was very interested in two-second time delay. From a U.S. military point of view, that's about two satellite jumps. So if you're going to across a long distance, that's about the same amount. And we were able to show that you can do simple tasks, uh, uh, some of the orthopedic tasks you could do. But when it came to more complex surgical tasks, two-second time delay was way too much, and you really required to automate. In NEMO 12 missions, we used the M7 robot, and we actually uh, uh, automated some of its tasks, and we were able to show that that robot is capable of some degree of automation. Clearly, that was very rudimentary and, and crude, but it basically showed where we need to go in research and development in future uh, to make telesurgery a, a, a real possibility in, in, a, in, a, in a more extreme environment. Uh, the other challenge was the fact that size matters. And the current commercial system, uh, the intuitive surgical, it's a great system, but it's extremely large. Uh, the, the actual robot itself uh, weighs about 1,200 pounds, and then you have two consoles. Um, as you can see above in, in that little clip, uh, even in the small operating rooms in, in northern Canada, uh, there are small rooms, there are multi-purpose rooms, you have to offer a wide range of surgery, and then certainly you can't put big robots in them. In the battlefield or in other extreme environments, even worse, that the space is, 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 is often tight, and you really, the weight and size of the robot matters. So and my, my hope is that uh, companies, which obviously have to work in a civilian, will see some benefit of reducing the size. And until then, it is very difficult to transfer some of these robots into a more extreme environment. Um, the other component is ability to be teleoperable. And that requires certain algorithm. Believe it or not, even though M7 was a fully teleoperable system, that was how it was developed, in its evolution to become uh, uh, the, the, the Vinci system, 
it has lost its teleoperability. The, the software uh, which goes on to control has made it almost impossible. Now, there was a U.S. military program which allowed uh, uh, Intuitive to show that it is possible for it to become teleoperable, but at some expense. Uh, but I think what we need is a fully teleoperable system which allow surgeons to operate the system uh, uh, from, from a distance. Now, a number of other lessons learned from our original uh, telesurgical experience. First and foremost, uh, one of the questions everybody asked initially was, would a patient allow us to have a surgery from a, when a surgeon is not even in the room at and maybe hundreds of miles away? What we learned was that patients accept telesurgery if they perceive that this is, provides them a real benefit. They, they don't care where the surgeon is. If they're alive and well after the surgery, they accept it. Um, Clearly, adequate bandwidth is required, and what I say quality of service means you want to make sure your, your signal takes priority over every other signal. And I recognize in the battlefield circumstances, there are so many other important communication, and that has always sometimes been a channel. So do the me medical uh, 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 sort of uh, communication get the same type of urgency as some of the other uh, uh, services that are required? But certainly in even civilian life, uh, when we did our telesurgery, we had to ensure that our uh, medical signals uh, get there the fastest uh, using public uh, uh, communication lines. Privacy and confidentiality, we found very easily, can be achieved even on, on, on public uh, sort of uh, internet lines. Uh, it's, it's not an issue. You can code and decode the, the signals at either end with, without much uh, latency. Redundancy of telecommunication is necessary. If you your only line of connection between the surgeon and the patient is a telecommunication line. You can't rely on, ju on just a single line. You really need to make sure there is redundancy. For all our telesurgery, we get triple redundancy, but we really never needed to use it except once. And so um, I don't know whether how many people remember the big blackout in the New York State in 2003. Um, so a, a big component of the uh, southern Canada and New York went black for, uh, there was no power for almost uh, eight hours. Our hospital lost full power. The only area of the hospital which did not lose power was our telesurgical suite. And I was able to do telesurgery because we had so much inbuilt redundancy into our system. And I think that's a very important lesson is that in these extreme environments, you have to allow for those type of possibilities. And we were able to, 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 to actually perform surgeries. Um, now, to make telesurgery a reality, uh, besides the investment that the U.S. military and other like-minded organizations make, we also need commercial civilian companies to also invest. And for them, the telesurgery right now still has a number of challenges. Uh, first and foremost is lack of remuneration for the telesurgeon. All of the telesurgeries I have done and I do Nobody remunerates because even the Canadian government says unless you're in the same uh, locality as a patient or in the same hospital, you cannot bill for it. Now, they are starting to look at it and understand that this is uh, something that needs to be changed. Uh, liability and licensing is a big issue, uh, certainly in the United States. Uh, again, who's responsible for the care, the telesurgeon from a distance or the local person who's helping uh, resuscitate the patient? Uh, training and credentialing. Um, what applications would be teleoperable, telesurgery uh, would p play a role. We've basically showed that it is possible to, tele to do telesurgery in any procedure, whether it's neurosurgical procedure, orthopedic procedure, urological procedure, trauma, and or more elective operations. So the limit is not what you can do. The limit is you need to decide what are the procedures which you really need to do in a teleoperable uh, one of the other richer uh, uh, experiences I've had is, is telecollaboration, where two surgeons collaborate with each other to perform a surgery from a distance. One more experienced surgeon, one less experienced. So, and now actually I see that more applicable also in battlefield because uh, you have a surgeon in the battlefield, they may have some experience, but they're not necessarily an expert in every aspect. And you may often have a difficult case where you might say, I wish I had so-and-so here with me to assist me in this. And again, well, that's where the telesurgery actually really uh, shines because the two surgeons can work seamlessly. And I did that in, in training a surgeon in North Bay. Where I, where I was able to take him through 20 cases 
and each, each operation was able to allow him to do more and more of the surgery to the point that by the 20th, he was completely uh, uh, capable and trained to do those surgeries on his own. And it really was an ex extremely rich experience how robot is able to do that. Now, um, the military is still making some investments. Uh, they, the last program that they supported was a tra tra uh, trauma pod program, which was really automating and, and, and bringing some of the, the, the various uh, 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 robots uh, together to see if we can actually deliver. And then, of course, uh, uh, miniaturization and making robots smaller and, and, and more capable is, is part of it. Uh, this is the trauma, last iteration of the trauma program. You now see a number of robotic systems working together to perform a task. There is a, a little scrub nurse bringing uh, sutures to the uh, robot, and then now you see the, uh, it's changing the tool on the other robot. So potentially in future, it is possible to have a fully automated operating room, uh, but right now it's, we're still a, a, a while away from that type of uh, modality. Until then, obviously, there are new systems and development, some in Canada, some in the United States, and some in Europe, uh, which I think bring some hope with respect to where systems are going. Uh, systems which are image guided, which are capable of uh, uh, stabilizing spines. Uh, systems which have uh, miniaturized, miniaturized and are capable of performing uh, small tasks within the patient. So the, f the future, I think, bright for telesurgery. Uh, how quickly we get there depends on the amount of investment which is made in the field. Thank you very much.